It's a different vibe than the other ones. They're not the same glasses. Beep. Boop beep a doop boop boop beep boop beep a doop a doop boop 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 beep boop a doop boop boop beep boop boop a doop a doop do do doop 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 do 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 anyone know that one anyone know that song do 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 anybody does that sound like anything did everybody just stop talking about a coup just overnight it seems like everyone just decided to it just like kind of quietly and embarrassingly go back on all that beverly hills cop theme correct axel f well done uh yeah, everyone just seems to have sort of like realized, oh, he's complaining about ratings again and how Fox News is very unfair to him. Maybe he's not in the bowels of the Pentagon planning a fucking uh, a caravan of death to decapitate the fucking Democratic Party and the uh, and fulfill the the prophecy of Q. Uh, no. No, I did not stop that talk. I think people just couldn't sustain it because it's like, it's a joke. It's a joke. And the thing is, the people who want to still say mad, they want to still keep keep their dick up about this stuff and can't but have to admit that it's not going to be a coup. What they say is, yeah, but it's not good that they won't admit the outcome of a pretty clear election and it's not good that 70 million Trump voters are not going to think that Biden's legitimate uh, and it doesn't signal good things for the trajectory of democracy. I would say that for the trajectory of the democracy question, the answer is, yeah, what is good about the trajectory of anything? Why would this be an exception? I mean, it's just, it's the weather. It's like climate change. Like these are accelerating crises and they all reflect off of each other. So yeah, it's going to get worse. That doesn't mean that you should spend the moment that you're in right now fretting about something that cannot happen. How the hell does that help you live your life how does that how hell you how, how the hell does that help you uh, help the people around you or figure out where your energy should be put if you're imagining an apocalypse that is not going to happen? Yeah, in the uh, something like a judicial coup with like some massive putting down of protest against it, uh, some like just obviation of a clear electoral victory by like a Democratic candidate that could happen, but not now. So why worry about it or like? feel like you have to direct your energies towards what? Anticipating it in some way? There's nothing you could do if you wanted to. And that's, the good news is you don't have to. But for the other thing about, oh, it's bad that they're doing this because it's delegitimizing him in the eyes of Trump's voters. They don't, they would not view Biden as legitimate no matter what Trump did. They didn't view Obama as legitimate. And they didn't even really feel Clinton as legitimate. And it's because the Republican, I've talked about this, the Republican conception of America, like as this unity, means that when it is led by someone who is not representing of their conception of what that country is, and what that citizen is, and who they are because they identify psychically with it, and even what God is because it's all a reflection of their like greater you know lack of spirituality, their materialized spirituality, uh... They say, oh, that's not really the president. He has. He was from Kenya. Uh, the, a bunch of illegal immigrants voted. There was theft. That's how they psychically said it. Now, the thing about that, though, is that it doesn't really matter. Because at the end of the day, they're as atomized and, and narconized and bedeviled and ensorcelled by media as we all are. As incapable of coordinated action. Or even the motivation to pursue that kind of action because remember this is entertainment politics is at the end of the day more and more as it becomes less and less connected to changing the conditions of your life as we take for granted more and more the conditions cannot change our politics becomes an entertainment it becomes a place for us to express our otherwise inexpressible tensions and gain catharsis that cannot be gained from a real engagement with our material conditions 
And that means that this is very much like rooting for a team. And when you lose the Super Bowl, you might get mad. You might hit your wife. You might fucking uh, burn down, uh, you know, a fucking sporting goods store or turn over a car. But you're not going to be able to have a society that sustains like a be able first is able to coordinate itself in anything other than Facebook groups and then direct energy in any way that is self-sacrificing because no one's thinking they're actually changing the conditions of their lives. They just think they're changing who's in charge, what team is up, who wins the game. And that means when the real shit hits the fan, they're going to bust out a karaoke machine or they're going to just stay home and bitch about it. And that is why this whole argument I've been trying to start about college and how it relates to the Democratic Party is frustrating because a lot of people want me to admit that this means that they are a class because it functions as like this regulator of the political discourse on the left, which is, you know, has captured the working class and that it's like this spider web and that it has, it, it, it might not be capital, but it carries out like a direct, uh, you know, superstructurally crucial role for capital. And I would say that, I mean, that's true in the sense that everything that is structurally embedded within these systems is, create, you know, reinforces them. Otherwise they wouldn't be there or they would be being whittled down. You know, if, if they're if they're useful, they're in there. But I would say that in general, the political struggle as we understand it is not um, like preventing any kind of political oct- opposition, any kind of class-based opposition to the current moment from appearing. What is stopping that from appearing is the fact that we do not live as class citizens because culture has atomized us. Culture and geography... And the way Americans work and think about class, because of just the 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 the, the reality of us coming down from the post World War II Fordist compromise and still operating in its uh, like imaginative understanding and its politics, has us have an, a, a, a a distorted view of its actual efficacy. And. That is why challenging within the party structures, like either taking over the Democratic or taking over the Republican parties, is from both sides impossible because you cannot marshal the forces. Everyone you're trying to marshal is in the bubble. And that means they're going to sort from one team to the other and be used by the structures that control both parties, the neoliberal consensus and its apparatus of control, the real fucking uh, kingmakers, the ones who everyone's dancing for in their heads, one way or another, trying to trying to carry out the pantomime of living like the type of life and embodying the type of values in your performance of self, uh, in social media and at your work, that you are rewarded with a middle class existence. But that enemy and alienation that has cannot cannot be brought to uh, political fruition through the political system, because what did we see with the 2020 election? We saw a bunch of working class, non-college educated people entering the voting rolls. More importantly than the shift even from like white Republicans who went to college deciding that actually, you know what, all these norms and shit, which are part of the parcel of things I picked up in college and have allowed me to prosper in life, I believe in those. I don't believe in all the stuff about white privilege or whatever and feeling bad about things, but I believe that stuff I learned and they're becoming Democrats. That matters less than the fact that you've got a bunch of working class people coming in and they are... uh, they're being exposed to an argument between parties, the premises of which they have not invested in. And so they don't see it as a question of values the way that people within it do. They see it as a question of affect. And the working class affect is going to be more likely to become embodied in something like a, a truculent insistence on doing what you want because the rule system that's supposed to get you advancement, that's supposed to get you the sugar cubes that you imbibe through college, is not there. And so a lot of them, disproportionately guys, are going to see the sort of toxic dude's rockness of the asshole don't be a pussy party and respond to it. 
And that means that you lose the one thing you need in a democratic system to enact change from below, which is working class contribution to the electoral process that is coordinated along the axis of actual material class, which we had until the 70s and which has broken up ever since. And we are in the process of it breaking up further. And none of this has to do with your job. None of it has to do with anything. It has to do with affect. And it's not the only thing that determines politics, but I'm saying the trajectory is one where this polarization continues and all energy within the two-party structure and with the ideological conceptions of this two-party, this anth thesis antithesis that is just spinning into nothingness because of the, ne the negative dialectical like in interrogative space that it inhabits, where it exi all this argument exists to be had and all this stuff exists to distract from the fact that nothing is fundamentally changing in the way people's lives are lived and the misery they feel and that there can't be. It is to distract from that. And so any uh, uh, working class opposition to the system is going to come outside of it. And I think it would be eventually and quickly the form of a political party because that is something that we all understand in America, even if we don't participate in politics. When we think of politics, we think of voting because it is what we have observed. Even if we didn't go to college, even if we didn't get all the etiquette lessons, we know that, that politics is voting. Like, we have a deep, as Americans, like, receptiveness to the idea that this is, like, what it means to be political. And you might say, well, if things are bad enough, that might turn into, you know, a Maoist insurgency. And it's like, yeah, it might. But barring that, like, accelerating circumstance, if you're talking about more of this, like, bad and getting worse, but on this slow slide, not a collapse, then people are at some point going to pick up the tools of politics as they understand them, as American subjects if not political, yet political subjects. And they will apply them to the, to the task of politics and it will form, and it will take the form of a political party. It's happened before and it will happen again. So that's where I'm putting my marker down on this. Everything else is just window dressing. And I know they say, and I know, and I have always thought third party is for chumps. And I will say this, every existing third party is for chumps. Nope, don't want to hear it. Don't want to hear about PSL. Don't want to hear about uh, fucking Greens. Don't want to hear about any of this shit. Don't want to hear about Rocky de la Fuenta. None of you are free from sin. This party will have to emerge organically from a working class movement of workers acting in their self-interest as workers, as in an expression of a labor movement, the way that the first labor parties were built in Europe in the 19th century. The way we were prevented from having ours built because the working class did not come into existence alongside popular participation in government the way it did in Europe. It came afterwards. And so they became, the working class became a, uh, a disaggregated, uh, um, a disaggregated interest group sort of within the greater party system. Like Northern Democrats were, uh, Northern working class people were Democrats, but their relationship was not as a political, like as not as uh, laborers because they, these, this, was, this was before the labor unions even existed in any like, real form. It was as individuals in a patronage networks, ethnic patronage networks like the Tammany Hall in New York, the Irish in Boston. Uh, and that was how they were. They saw their relationship to the Democratic Party. Uh, the small bourgeois were uh, were uh, or the the small holders, like the small holders, like a guy who owns his land and like sells surplus of it. Sort of, you know, like a, a, a you know that distinct American caste, the yeoman. The ones in uh, the South were uh, Democrats. The ones in New England. Or uh, the upper strata, uh, like the Western Reserve of of uh, the Midwest, they were Republicans because of issues about because of the relation their issue their relationship to what boiled down to in the North for them as a cultural issue. And it took the New Deal to break that up. And to create, uh, not more specifically, it took the Democrat, it took the huge explosion of working class militancy of the Depression 
and then for the existing networks that connected the working class where it did to the Democratic Party being just flooded by everything coming together, them being in opposition, them being uh, able to outbid the Republicans on any argument of being like the party of workers because the Republican Party was uh, incapable of generating within itself a response to the depression because it couldn't. This was a thing that negated its principles. So it could not operate from its principles. And everyone understood that. Even Republicans understood that at a certain level. And so they were able to, the, the Republican part, the Democratic Party was able to embody for the first time the, the not yet self-conscious, but as close as we have ever seen, self-conscious expression of a working class uh, interest, self-interest which was get rid of this laissez-faire business of America is business Coolidge horseshit. Give us a planned economy, at least to the extent that we can be- provide basic uh, security for people, uh, basic dignity for work, and a bigger piece of the fucking profit that is produced by our exploitation. A seat at the table of democracy. And that's what they got. And it would be that process again. Now, the difference is, the Democratic Party would have to break up in this process the way that the Republicans uh, emerged from the breakup of the Whigs. And I honestly, that's a question that is going to really come down to exogenous events that I can't predict. But I, I would simply say I don't think that that is as absurd as some people think it is. I think that there could be a significant crack up within the Democratic Party. I think that the Biden administration will accelerate it and I think that if there could be an organization of people that like that comes along as as you know as as the need to look around oneself to provide basic security as as you're sliding down you know the face of the avalanche and people turn towards each other to try to stay afloat, that that will emerge. And if it does, there will be pressure within both parties for people to defect. And if it if it if it really is shorn of the culture war horseshit at every level, if it's shorn of the apputerance, if it's shorn of the of the symbology of the two parties, which is totally taints everything that's within them, you could honestly get a significant chunk of people from both fucking parties, from the bottom of both parties' current support. And if that happened, the Democratic Party loses all coherence. Snaps up the way that the Whigs did, as soon as slavery became a red line. What broke up the Whigs was that slavery, which had been in the Whig Party like it had been in the Democratic Party because both were national parties that sought to ignore the slavery issue in, uh, 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 and you know, prevent breaking up along sectional lines, uh, their policy was to just uh, be against slavery in general, be less for slavery than the Democrats were, less for expansion than the Democrats were, but not in any sort of absolute sense. And it was Kansas. It was the admission of Kansas that provided a bright line case. And both parties, the people who made up those parties in the North who were caring more and more about slavery because they saw it more and more as the salient issue of politics, got to a point where they were insisting to both parties that your support for a free and free Kansas is sine qua non with our support for you as a party. And because the, because the Whigs started out as a more anti-slavery party, because it was a middle-class party and there was a broader uh, opposition to uh, slavery in the middle class because anti, because slavery was against the, the mores of this emerging urban lifestyle that we now are living in like the to total hege- hegemony of. And so it was a bigger, it was a more, it was a, it had been an issue for Whigs longer, so the Whigs were more brand identified with being opposed to slavery because people opposed slavery for moral reasons before they opposed them for material reasons because it took a very long time for uh, the working class and smallholders in the North to see slavery as not a separate system that you might like or not like for moral reasons, but a direct uh, uh, competing um wage relationship that they might end up having to I, having to compete with and eventually be subsumed by it took them longer to get there so that means the Whigs broke up first over that issue and if the ho- coming horror that we're seeing makes a genuine like 
Sanders was the compromise, like social democratic intervention in the economy, a, a, a necess, necessary red line, you could see the Democratic Party break under its own contradictions. But again, a zillion things would have to happen for that to occur. I just think when I game it out in my head, when I get in Cerebro and try to game out my head what's coming, when I think of ways that could avoid the worst outcomes, they all involve something like this. And I know that that's not much, but it's all we really have. Everything's probabilities and just percentages and just everyone thriving in every moment on the knowledge that we don't really fucking know. We can't know because events intervene. Shit comes to light and it changes the entire trajectory. What I mean is like, stop, there's possibility all around us that we could grasp it if we actually sought it instead of sought an excuse to avoid it by running through the same arguments over and over again online and then believing we're contributing to a sterile political process. Oh, the Democrats, they scorn me because of all their wokeness. The Republicans, they, they really take this cult, this, uh, they really take all the principles that I take seriously about like egalitarianism and the principle of, you know, like socialism, all that stuff that I believe. They believe that, right? They believe that stuff. That, that's, all that stuff about culture isn't like from the other end. It's just from the end of I like the hierarchy. Not that it was like embedded in a more egalitarian uh, like social provision, a social relationship where a greater percentage of your like species regeneration came from a social interaction that is being stripped of life and replaced by dead market relationships. That's what they're really alienating. That's what they miss. But what makes someone reactionary in part is when they identify uh, the hierarchies imposed in those things as the th generators of the, of the good parts of it. And that's not. The hierarchies are just... Are, those are the things that remain. Those are the things that then are then fused with capitalism to perpetuate it. They, were, they are the parts that remain from these... Because like a synthesis, when a synthesis and antithesis collide, it is not a complete uh, destruction like antimatter and matter. There is a remainder... And that is the synthesized remainder of the two things, something else. And the thing that gets synthesized out of old cultures that are brought under pressure by capitalism is all of the worst parts. All the best parts get turned into market. All the best parts get turned into abstractions and transactions. And so that's why you're marching over to the fucking Republican Party. They will always take uh, the, the, just the, the sadistic, the most sadistic, worst version of what all the SJWs say capitalism is. That's all they can embody because that's what they actually value. Just like stripped of people who actually care about each other, the fucking uh, ID Paul, you know, woke capitalism is just the same neoliberal death machine slowly whittling away at the human like condition, both individually and in numbers, like killing people and, and, and bringing catastrophic death to people, but doing so in the name of like this righteous, uh, uh, you know, justice and this, this righting of wrongs that is purely stripped of its, its universality that can be the only engine of real love. And the only way you're going to resolve these tensions is if you do not engage in them in the first place. It's a fucking cliche and it comes from a dumb movie, but the only way to win is not to play. In nuclear war, in Twitter politics, in electoral politics between the Democratic and Republican parties at this point. Other than, I will stipulate, grassroots movements around specific candidates for specific offices. Nithya Raymond things, things like that. Because some of those people are, some of those people in this new party would come from the Democratic Party, but not from its heights, not from its celebrity tier, but from, like, the level of local municipalities, absolutely. Like, you're seeding the ground when you work on a campaign, even a Democratic campaign, at the local level. You are seeding the ground the way that those fucking wackos uh, for Goldwater did in the 60s. And yes, it's like this has now become a sterilized political uh, dynamic, but that means it's going to break up. 
That's what happens in the terminal decade, the terminal decline phase, when it becomes completely stagnant, something breaks it up. That's how it, what happens historically with all stalemates. And you can get on the ground floor. You too can get on the ground floor. If you find a campaign, not saying that's the only thing you can do, but that sure shit is a thing you can do. And like people who worry about AOC, people like to say AOC is a neoliberal sellout. She's trying to destroy the working class movement. And you know, honestly, maybe, who knows? She posts a lot of cringe. I'll say that for sure. Her, her instincts are about as managerial as you could imagine. She all, she is one of the, she speaks only to college educated people. I mean, in a real way. Uh, she speaks only to college educated people and she could be effective within that boundary, but over time, she will become the neoliberal caricature. Even if she didn't start that way and isn't yet, over time, she will have to become the neoliberal caricature of her because that will be the only center of political gravity, will be within the culture, sterile culture war of the Democratic Party. She will become less and less committed to anything other than the most performative uh, elements of leftism because that's all that's going to be incentivized. And it won't be her fault, really. It'll be, be unless she, I mean, it'll be up to her. She could quit. But if she keeps, like most of us, we keep rationalizing why we're doing what we're doing if we like doing it. We all are, every day. Don't front like you're not. And she's like, hey, you know, who, who of us without sin? If there's a fucking, like, actual working class movement, like, behind her back, somebody like that could help be in the breeze to get the college people as a backdraft. Because they have to come in the backdraft. They were, like, the Warren people were never going to go for Bernie, Ever. Because they were fundamentally opposed to his politics. They were the winners. They were the, like, Bernie versus Warren was the winners versus losers in the college sweepstakes. Like, that was it. Warren was for the kids who went to college, came out. I mean, once again, we're talking in broad strokes. There's plenty of Republicans who go to college. I'm saying of the ones who come out and commit to, like, democratic politics as a venue for their political aspirations. The ones who succeeded... The ones who got the job, they were like Warren because they didn't really want to see things change that much. And all of their justifications were post hoc to that. The losers like Bernie. And so within certain structures, there is a progressiveness to this. Now, a lot of people think, well, they also ruined it for everybody else because they got their collegeness all over our movement. And... Uh, my real when I look at the way that the, 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 the campaign shaped up, I don't really think that's the case really. I think that more than anything, the campaign didn't invest enough in outreach in communities as opposed to advertisements. That's a genuine mistake they made. But in general, I feel like the ground in that context in to that before COVID, in the malaise that we were in. In this Trumpian malaise, there's just like, everything's hysterical, but we're also getting banged over the head with a, but it's also everything's the same and monotonous. And like, we're in the same sort of suspended animation, uh, like pseudo recovery, where we see all around us that the economy is great, but all of our lives are still shitty and getting worse. But we don't notice because we're more and more invested in our, enter, in our entertainments and our distractions. And we're, and, and we're numbing ourselves more and more to it. So we're not even aware. In that context, I don't think enough people were paying attention to any of it. And I don't think anything Bernie could have said would have breached it because it would have been more politician speak. It would have been more political bullshit. Because the ma one of the things that defines the non-college view is that this stuff is bullshit. And that is one of the cases where we're not talking about, oh, college people are like more liberal and more leftist because they're smarter or whatever. They are actually, in many sense, are much have much more uh, false consciousness than non-college educated people because they believe that politicians are actually doing something. And you could say, but some of them are like Bernie, but it's like part of the reason that happens is because people are invested in it. Like this is all predicated on a, a, a illusion that is being propagated society-wide 
and work and uh, non-college educated people are more likely to see through that. Now that doesn't mean they have perfect vision. A lot of them will then like Trump because he's not like those politicians because they saw him on TV and that's all something else that they didn't get right that a college edu educated person could see through. But the point of this is that everybody is dealing with the fo these lenses of false awareness because they are not experiencing class directly because we don't. Because of our Pringle tubeness, our lack of a, 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 a shared experience because we've mediated life geographically and socially. Pringle Tubin, R.I.P. <sighs> so yeah, I think one thing to remember is like, when we're talking about this group, this college educated group, I hate to th call it, a, it's not a class and I've said that, but you, PMC doesn't work either because it literally has the word class in it. I've called it a pseudo class, and I think that's good enough. It has the appearance of a class in our broken, refracted politics, our non-material politics that we don't know aren't material. So we're not even moving towards materiality because we are unaware of it at like, not at an individual level, but at a level of group action, at a level of demographics and populations. We are not aware of that enough to act that way. We act like these things matter because we participate in society and then 60% of us go and vote every four years, acting like it matters. That's what matters. And so that means anything that operates within those parameters, because we're talking about voting, right? Like none of the, all this stuff about manners and, and you know, like uh, cultural capital, it doesn't matter anything unless it directs to political power and political power is expressed through elections, right? and through politics. So how do they ap operate within the political realm? They do not operate as classes. So they are not classes. They are pseudo classes. So even the working class within, in terms of voting population is a pseudo class. People have said cohort two. I like cohort. Pringle managerial class. There you go. I like pseudo class because otherwise it it operates as a class because we're talking about election results at demographic levels. What do people do? They vote. How do they vote? This is how they vote. But it isn't because the politics that it's invested in are not being invested by people who are voting as members of a class in any way, in any sense, and are not, and are not moving towards it. They aren't even under a false impression they're doing it. I like Pringles. We are all lumpen is the thing. Like the lumpen proletariat were, were, for Marx were essentially like the remainder of the division problem of, you know, bringing people out of the social in net networks of, uh, of the feudal countryside into the marketized uh, 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 impersonality of urban life. You, there's going to be a remainder. There's going to be the people who aren't able to function within those structures for whom the... Uh, are going to fall out of ability to uh, find through because either they have an incapacity of body or mind or a disinclination, some sort of inborn or acquired through life disinclination to the the uh, social um, rituals uh, of domestication of urban domestication, and those people spin off and they become the card sharps and the and the uh, and the boulevardiers and the and the rogues and 
the thing that marks them is their inability to recognize themselves as class because they're going around the city like all these workers are. All these workers are going around the city. But what are the workers doing? They're getting up in their worker tenements. They're going down in shifts to the factory. They're working together in the factory. Guy's arm gets cut off. They pull it, got, get it in the factory. They got to yell at the foreman for them to get uh, to stop the machine so they get the guy's arm out. They all experience this together. They come out. They drink together. Their kids hang out together. They go to sleep together. Just this experience is what generates class consciousness. As this is happening, people within that circuit are getting thrown off of it. Some, the guy who gets his arm cut off, he can't work anymore. He, fall, he becomes indigent. He's no longer a laborer. He's not, he's, he depends on alms. Or maybe he turns to a life of crime. Like the third kid in the family who is never fits in and gets thrown out of school and runs out onto the streets. And then they live in this city, but they are not, they are living lives, catch as catch can. And then they are, can be brought sort of by, towards the magnet of authority and, 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 uh, and uh, personal uh, bribery uh, and demagoguery because of that. We are now all in that condition, that social condition of the lumpen uh, in Marx. Because we have now, we have that relationship of social proximity that generates class consciousness is gone. So we have the strangeness and the enemy of the urban environment that the peasants were brought into in stages universalized. No matter, it doesn't matter if you live in the middle of nowhere, you live in this socially atomized urban space that the, that the uh, rural uh, peasantry was brought into. And instead of creating a class conscious working class, it has created an entirely lumpen society where every strata, regardless of their relationship to means of production, has a lumpen attitude, has an unreconcilable attitude towards that which is around them. And that's why if there's going to be any hope, it's going to be people who do have the closest thing remaining to the social relations of intimacy that the classic working class did. Retail employees, for one. Big box Retail employees, Amazon fulfillment centers. Where there still are factories. And hospitals. Um, lots of people work in a fucking hospital. They talk. And the thing is, this would, if this is going to happen, it's going to happen at, on a, on, at a, at probably at like a location by location, uh, uh, fashion, like the fucking 1905 revolution, like that. 1905. Think, I've been saying this for a while now, and I think, I think I'm onto something, and I've not been the only one to say this. If there is any, like, and, and again, there is a huge caveat here. That is, if there is any revolutionary potential to the remainder of like the social formation of planet Earth. If, and there's a big if, that's what it would look like to me. 1905. I hope some of this made sense. I hope this resolves some of the questions people have had because I've been a little annoyed with myself more than anything of my inability to get what I'm trying to say across, but I will say in my own defense that a lot of it is because people have an investment in willfully misreading a lot of it because they feel personally attacked by it. Although I do not blame them for that at all. It's my job to get over that. It's my job to figure out a way to disarm that objection. And if I don't, it's because I was too careless of my language. And I apologize. And also there are people who are very invested in one side of the or the other of on the on the meta argument about this on Twitter or on, on uh, th or, uh, you know, on, on broad, online generally. The ones who are, no, I have to define the PMC and then fight them. And if it means joining the Republicans, then good, because they are the enemy now and they run things and they make everything bad. And, and defeating them is the only way to – they are the near enemy who must be defeated. So we must – the enemy – the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And they want you to fucking admit to their point of view. And then the people who say, no, you need to, you need to admit that, uh, like, there's nothing, there's no such thing as cultural capital, that there's nothing stopping, 
like a culture, a political culture that is almost entirely made up of people who have received the same general social existence, the same sort of ambiguous relationship to uh, the means of production that uh, is common in the American middle class, as we call it. Uh, your family is most likely of that, and you are too. And that even if you are personally poor or working a hyper exploited labor, uh, a hyper exploited gig economy job or something, you probably have family resources to back uh, to fall back on that non college educated people in general don't. And they want you on one side or the other of this fucking thing. They want you to pretend that that's not a real issue and that we're, it's all fine and that AOC is going to crump us to social democracy. Not going to happen. But Tucker Carlson's going to not bring in some epic uh, groiper social republic. Why would they need to? Why would they need to? Look at the Republicans did without offering anybody anything materially at all on earth. Why would they not double down on culture? And the people who are, those working class people who are moving towards Republicans, they're clearly not doing it because they're motivated by a desire to see the, uh, to see, you know, the great power of wealth, concentrated wealth brought down. If they, what about Trump's campaign would have made them do that? It was about how his big shits wouldn't go down the toilet. It was about Antifa thugs and BLM and riots. And it was about fracking apparently. And it was about the cultural drumbeat. And that is going to appeal to people more and more. And I say, because it is, in many ways, aesthetically preferable. Because it allows for catharsis. It says, we're fucked, but you might as well have fun with it. Why are you making me feel bad when none of us have any idea about changing any of this? None of us have the will or interest to actually move against our most narrow selfishness to even try to stop what's coming why are you whining about it? That's a powerful message. And I think a better one, honestly, politically, is in like vote for one or the other. And over time, I think it will become much more persuasive to people. So you got to devote yourself to other, if like, not when you're doing your politics, not when you're doing your tweets and owns, keep doing your tweets and owns, watch your shows, watch your programs, listen to your pods. We got to get through this life. But then in that spot in your fucking body and your soul where doing those things counted as having a political li uh, identity that like gave you a sense of purpose and a sense that you were striving towards your best self and towards universal love, uh, you got to find something else to do. Yeah, Bolsonaro literally said, don't be an F-slur about it. We have corona, don't be an F-slur about it. The man, it's like, thank you, you're proving my thesis, because obviously everyone knows, right, that Brazil is just accelerated America, right? Brazil is America without the post-war boom. I mean, you know, in broad strokes. It's social formations, it's politics. And so, and so you see that farther down the slope from us, is the right populist party, the non-college party, saying, don't be a bitch about it. Don't be a pussy about it. In explicit words and not just metaphorically. So look at this. Bolsonaro is running the explicit version of Trump, the campaign Trump ran on. And it has appeal. Because the other one, let's all feel bad, is predicated on a... In, like a instant, like a Foucaultian, like in Bo, imposed internal mind prison, that is not necessarily bad because it does speak towards actual concern for other people. It's good. It's not bad. The problem is, if you're trapped in it, you are not aware that all you're doing is recycling your anxiety, and you're not actually directing your energies anywhere. And that's where it's counterproductive. It's and that's the big divide. I think that's another big problem with the argument online. It's like there's this normative, there's this, um, there's this uh, 
qualitative argument about like whether or not it's a it makes you like it's evil or something like there is it, it very much about like these are bad people and of course that's the way all these arguments boil down remember they're not about determining truth or uh us persuading anyone they're about determining good and bad people both sides it's about shibboleths that's what it is and uh i was talking about the shibboleths god damn it I lost my train of thought. Oh, and yeah, so it, it depends on you having this like internal engine of anxiety where you're internally aware of your like either sense of grievance if you feel yourself as a victim or sense of guilt if you feel yourself as a perpetrator. And of course, not everybody feels not the, some type of that at any given time. And it's not the same all the time. Nobody is like one thing. But some combination of those things is driving your anxiety because you cannot fundamentally pace the source of your alienation, which is class-based, which if you went through this thing, you do not think. Even if you think you think it's class, you don't really think it's class, if that makes sense at all. Class has been filtered through the bubble of, oh, you can't change class. You can't change material conditions. Remember, these guys tried and failed, and a lot of them were white men. Like that's already built into it. And so you think you're thinking about class, but you're not because you've already forsworn real class collaboration. And once again, it's not about you being a bad person. It's not about you being a good person. It's not about you being smart. It's not about you being dumb. It's a mirrored uh, delusion across the divide. It is a false consciousness is reinforced by this continual reaffirmation of it in the form of this social media, uh, like uh, uh, social media slash social credit entrepreneurial space. <sighs> Whoo! Yeah, it's it's not so much cold as it's rainy right now. It was rainy for the last two days. Because, you know, even Uber drivers take Uber sometimes if they have to. Everyone is part of this machinery of extraction at one end or the other. And it's all a question of what they feel in any given moment to be the source of it. And American life is structured so that we basically never think of it as a class relationship. We think of it anything other than a class relationship. And so even our politics, which are built on these categories, are a pseudo-politics. Trump Andrew Jackson comparison. Trump is the is the completion. Well, not completion. He is like a a complete. Trump is a milestone on the the trajectory of the GOP of of, of broadly like Jeffersonian, the Jeffersonian American ideal. You know, if you want to like talk about things not as transitions through like different into different states, but like as you know, you want to trace an evolution. If you want to like start with Jefferson as you know, just the ex just the cultural expression of a, of a given social relationship, a, a theory of social relationship, the, the, the Southern planter economy that he represented. That forms what in a lot of other cultures what is a, a social formation that would be a, the peasant uh, community. Like, uh, uh, European conceptions, for example, of liberty when they grew up, when they, when, you know, the Enlightenment showed up and, you know, notions of politics began to expand, uh, the, they, their, their, those notions of what liberty were, was not, was, was, not, was bound in a social context of, of those peasant communities where, where, uh, one's freedom was deeply intertwined with one's, uh, ability to, uh, aid one another, basically. Like, like there was a, tr there was interconnectivity was freedom. Like you were free to the degree that you could coordinate actions. 
like and and you know like the, the uh, and um and there was like a social dimension to just every element of material life that is missing completely from the american understanding of like folk freedom because it emerged among a totally atomized and scattered population who was being driven outward with the force of the big bang to fill this vast empty space because the uh, possibilities for profit were so much that the pressure of people who wanted to fucking make it rich to 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 write themselves upon the land filled them and that is our folk uh liberty which is different in fundamental ways to folk conceptions of freedom in countries where uh where capitalism grew out of a feudal framework and out of feudal relationships and out of an awareness of one's subordinate position, this is important, one's subordinate position between a feudal overlord. The whole Jeffersonian, the magic of the Jeffersonian idea is that the, it, this is the land without an aristocracy. We do, and we keep the government small. No one can rule anyone else. And so the degree to which you are free is the degree to which you are unruled. But the feudal understanding of, 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 of life is that rule is inevitable, that rule, that being ruled is part of living, and the question is who is to be who are to, you to be ruled by? And that is why the pressure to move towards modernity was through this like this fire hose of, of outrage about like investing rule with popular will and not individual will, because the spell of uh, transcendent relationships, between ruling uh, figures and uh, you know their status on earth uh, was broken. Like the, the the as soon as the divine right of kings is gone, it's over. And and then we fill the space. And but no one can be on top in America. It's impossible, because that is the condition of freedom. The condition of freedom in the in the negotiatory you know uh, eternal world of the of the feudal feudal order uh, is is expansive and expands through. And it allows you to, you know, create ideas like social democracy and move towards a concept like socialism or communism. And that was the conditions that Marx observed and made all of his predictions because he thought this is what happens when capitalism is appears. And he was right to think that because this was the first ever place that capitalism had appeared. But what he could not possibly figure in is that the United States would take the central position that it has in hegemonizing the practice of capitalism and accelerating a trajectory of like a uh, crisis that uh, is only made possible because of its ability to neutralize class uh, awareness in a way that European society essentially was just not evolved to do. And so Jack Jackson is like the popular embodiment of that figure. Once, you know, you go through the early gentlemanly stage of the first party system. And once that breaks down and in order to, you know, do better, the Jeffersonians break the sort of gentleman's agreement to keep the franchise small in order to win these arguments with these federalists. And whoop, here come in the, the horny handed men of the soil and Jackson is the next embodiment of it. And the thing that's difficult, though, is that a lot of people who invest themselves in these notions that go from Jefferson there, the like the most refined version to Jackson to through Reagan and now to Trump, uh, is that they are a lot of them, the ones who don't actually benefit that much from the system and the ones who actually hurt a lot because of it and have acute class related uh, 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 trauma and pain in their lives, they have a very they have an understanding of freedom that is simply incompatible with connecting those pains to capitalism because capitalism was is what allows for the ability to live without a ruler to live without social uh, uh a social contract and 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 stepping away from total mastery and so you have this system this this 
this tension within American history where at every point, like the most, the greatest ambitions of the working class are suffused at the same time with these notions of, uh, of autonomy that undermine like the ability of the working class to cohere the way it did in Europe. And I think that's the answer fundamentally to the question, why was there never a socialist party in the United States? The one that was famously posed at the turn of the 19th century. And then what we finally got was much later, we got the 30s and we got the New Deal. And that was the first like real antithesis to be thrown up. I mean, first you had like the, the, the unrestrained version of that idea had to be destroyed in the Civil War, but it was not tamed because the class conditions did not obtain to defeat it because the working class has not yet established itself in a self-aware enough position to, to defeat it. And that meant that you have a long period where the working class is not able to express itself coherently because of its different cultural uh, matrices uh, and ge geography and the legacy of the Civil War. And it was only the Great Depression and the explosion of organization around it that allowed a coherence to form out of it. And it persisted into, and it has persisted and mutated over time and changed in its composition. But the broad like brand has been the same. The big difference, the big, the big, the big event that is invisible in the way people think about this is that in the 70s, the relationship between the working class and the Democratic Party was inevitably severed, I mean, completely severed, and irrevocably, I mean, irrevocably severed. Like, katana chop. Like fucking Jim Belushi, or John Belushi, as the samurai uh, deli guy. Wow. And that's, and we've been on the table ever since. And that is why I call the, the, the party system is now a complete puppet show. You know, it's one of those things that was always true in broad strokes, but in practical terms, i.e. how much do you invest in politics? It was always sort of like, well, yes, but there's actually stuff, in here, stuff here that's for stake, that's up for, up for grabs. And that has been decreasingly the case since the 70s. And now it's as low as it's been, and it's only going to get lower. Any political investment uh, is going to be profitably served in trying to come at an angle to this machinery and break it up before it smashes itself against the rock of American reaction, which will become universalized as conditions deteriorate. Because at the end of the day, liberalism is fascism with money. And so the degree to which we are liberal is going to be the degree to which there's still some money in the till. And when the social uh, contract is totally voided and all we have left is, is the merest like extraction of our own lives and, and, and the increasing warehouse of the unproductive version of uh, part of ourselves. Boy. You don't think that the whatever the political expression of that is is going to have the shape of of a fascist movement, even though in, pra in reality it will just be a spider. It'll be just a techno machine. It'll be an al algorithm expressing itself through the tendrils of Amazon and fucking uh, Raytheon and the fucking robots from Chappie and the Boston Dynamics guys and whatever the hell else it is. But it'll have like a, an American flag and a cross on it, just like Sinclair Lewis said. But we can stop it, and if we can, it's going to be because this thing, this monster, has to be broken up. Just like the Whigs, the Whigs and the Whigs could not be a viable uh, vehicle for uh, anti-slavery sentiment in the in the uh, North. That is, Whigs could not be a viable uh, vehicle to bring about the defeat of this competing economic system. Couldn't happen. And so the wings broke up. And they actually kind of broke up into wings. Because the Democratic Party, which the Whigs opposed, was made up of two main parts. The slaveocracy, 
the entire southern economies, which were totally con and uh, political uh, uh, structures, which are all completely controlled by slave interests, and urban Catholic patronage uh, uh, workers, the Tammany folks. And as the Whigs broke up, there basically came two question, two answers to the question: How do we? If if you're a Northerner, if you're a Whig, basically, if you're someone opposed to the 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 Jacksonian, the the rampant Jacksonianism, you're trying to impose some sort of like bourgeois order on this like rampaging, you know, quasi feudal uh, uh, pig, or like I don't even like this this unrestrained capitalist id, I guess. Or like a, a not even capitalist id, but a consumptive id, like this drive to consume the entire continent, which has to be restrained. If you're like, if these fuckers, how if the Whigs can't stop these people anymore, how are we gonna do it? And the people who joined the Republicans said we're gonna fucking take on the slaveocracy, and the know nothings emerged to say we're gonna take on these fucking Catholics in the cities. And a lot of it came down to how close you live to those Catholics. How much you cared about, you know, those culture wars versus how much you were you had your eye on the real ball. Because remember, increasingly for the working class broadly considered and the yeomanry and the middle class or whatever, you, all everybody basically uh, outside of like capitalism in the north, which is a big chunk of people because of it was still wild, mostly agricultural workers in this in, like yeoman farmers in the north. They saw slavery as a competing as a threat to their ability to sustain themselves as free workers and free laborers and freemen of the land. And so they said the Whigs aren't cutting it. And the people who had their eye on the ball went for what really mattered, which was slavery. The dumbasses who couldn't get their head out of the, like whatever particular passionate, you know, uh, symbolic play they've got going on in their head have to bash the head of a bunch of fucking uh, Irish people. Like it's literally how you see how like the crisis develops, and then you see within a political formation those people who like adhere towards something like a group self-interest that is opposed to capitalism, is opposed specifically in this instance to exploitation at its most horrific, versus those who get distracted and want to fight something about fucking the popedom and and the, the wicked uh, Rome is going to come and tell them what to do, not the fucking five hundred slave owners in Charleston and uh, and Richmond, who, who have their northern doe-faced presidents dancing like marionettes. And we're going to have a question again. As things get sharper, and as the question becomes more near, just as it did then, we're going to have to start asking ourselves, how, what are the tools we have? And the Democratic Party will not survive that uh, interrogation. Not saying it's going to happen, saying if it does, that's what it's going to look like. All right, guys, I think I went a little long today. Uh, all right, peace.